<clears throat> Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to the PEM podcast, episode number seven, Psychic Eye Mystery number seven. Um, I'm your host, Victoria Laurie, with my <laughs> sidekick, fabulous sister, Sandy, who actually comes up with all of these mysteries. So, um, you know, huge kudos to you, Sandy. You do a ton of research and it takes you a while to do each one of these and I super duper appreciate you. You make this like really easy for me. So thank you. And that's going to stop any... very soon. That's just ending. <laughs> just saying, like, don't give me any, I'm done. <laughs> boom. She can't even, she can't, she can't hold it. I'm in. done. She can't hold it back. Ah! Actually I'm done freaking myself out. So, <clears throat> oh, you say that now I know that there's going to be a mystery that you've come up against and you're like, okay, I need to get this out and take it to the incinerator. <laughs> Oh joy! Can't yeah, wait to find that. To write this down and then take the source to the incinerator. Oh, I love that. Um, okay, so our theme today is overall it's motherhood um, <clears throat> because it's been really interesting to me how many readings lately I have done with moms coming through and um, the the unconditional love that they feel for their children, mothers and grandmothers, but mostly mothers. Um, is really, uh, God, it's so humbling because I get to, I get to feel that love. So they kind of literally channel it through me. I'm sort of the gateway. And um, what I think is in particular, you know, I don't want to make this about me, but it is about me. Um, what I think in <laughs> Sandy's rolling her eyes. Shocker. Um, anyway, what I think is um, a gift, like such a beautiful, beautiful gift for me is like, um, I never knew uncondition unconditional love from my parents and, um, sort of experience it in a way that, um, isn't just viewing it. It's actually feeling that unconditional love as it, as it segues through me, um, is like, Jesus, it's so amazing. It's so healing, really. It's really, really healing. So, um, I'm loving the whole mediumship stuff. And um, I can feel myself getting better, 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 which is great. So <clears throat> used to be like hit or miss. And now it's like hit, 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 miss, hit, 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 miss. So if I miss on you, sorry, can't all be fantastic. Um, but I am getting better. Um, so I actually did one last night, Sans, um, I want to tell you about. So real quick, it's not a motherhood theme thing, but this was really cool. So <clears throat> I was reading for... Um, a woman, and I believe her, I think it was her grand uncle that came through, it was coming in and he identified himself um, pretty specifically, which was great. And she had a, she'd had a decent relationship with him and um, he kept saying B, say B. And um, so I'm like, okay, he keeps saying B, like was someone B? And he's like, well, his wife's name was Beverly. And I'm like, okay, did he ever call her B? <clears throat> She's like, no, he called her like birdie. And I'm like, okay, I don't, cause he kept saying B, say B. So I'm like, there's something with the B. And so I'm like trying to tune into this guy and he shows me this dog and I don't really take notice of it. And then he goes, say B like bingo. And so I'm like, okay, he's saying B like bingo. She goes, oh, that was the name of his dog. <laughs> so I thought that was adorable, adorable. B-I-N-G-O, bingo was his name. -o. So very, very cute. Um, okay. So we're going to tackle, you know, I had one of my, <clears throat> one of my um, students actually emailed me with Joni. Thank you for the suggestion. She emailed me to ask me why I don't tune in or try and tune in um, using my mediumship skills with um, some of these victims. And <clears throat> I don't think I've explained kind of the process um, that, that I'm doing when I'm, when I'm trying to pull stuff out of the ether. If that if that soul is available, I do feel their influence. I'm not having a conversation with them. I'm not pulling them forward and trying to get information out of them, mostly because who they're connected to, I have no contact with, right? So there's no relative for them to exert a ton of energy my way um, to try and prove that they're there, that they're there. So it's a it's it is an interaction, but it's a different interaction. It's almost like um, calling information and saying, do you have any information on this? Um, versus step forward, let me connect you with your loved one. So it's a little bit of a different relationship. So there are some of these um, mysteries where I feel a really, really solid, solid connection and I can kind of feel their influence. And what's really interesting to me is 
the um, servant girl annihilator, I didn't feel any connection to the victims. I felt a connection to the killer. Um, I felt his influence really, really strongly. Um, and not in a way that was like, I feel guilt for this. He was almost pride. Yeah. 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 Right. It, was, it was, that was freaky. Um, with um, Dorothy Arnold, I felt her really strongly because I felt I was like looking up through her eyes to see the last thing she saw in life, which was the moon, um, cloudy sky, with uh, partly cloudy sky with the moon um, and um, like feeling the cold the dark and the cold around her. Um, so I felt her influence there. Karina Homer, certainly I felt her influence. She was, she literally gave me the description of her killer. She was like, you know, aquiline nose is not something I use. I don't think I've ever written it in a book even. Um, but she kept saying he looks like this with an aquiline nose. So, um, that was, that was pretty interesting. Um, uh, Baron Huntbet, um, it was Marin. Marin was which smutty, one? Was smutty nose. Oh, she was smutty nose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I felt a connection to her. I didn't feel a connection to her victims. I felt a connection to her. So that's another killer, right? And then um, the ones I didn't feel. Well, can I just ask you in terms of Marin? Did you did you get a sense of her still kind of being cray cray, or more her craziness was the reasoning behind what happened? Do you know what I'm trying to say? Like, did her personality present as schizophrenic or is it more that she was telling you she was schizophrenic? More she was telling me. Yeah, um, because she's dead. So uh, the sickness doesn't yeah. pass beyond the veil. It stays here. Um, so it was more she was saying, you know, I heard voices um, kind of thing. Um, and, and again, it's not a direct conversation. It's sort of mm -hmm. their essence. You kind of feel their essence. Um, and then um, the ones that I haven't had um, a real good connection to were like the solder, the solder five, the disappearance of the, the kids who were killed in the fire. Um, I don't know, like that information felt like it was, it came more from their father than mm. it did from them. So I think when he crossed over and found that they were over there, he got the full scoop, the full story. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just, he just kept telling me they were in the basement. They were in the basement. They were in the basement. And, you know, it makes sense that he would come through and tell me that because <clears throat> he was the one that bulldozed over it. Yeah. So he could have, if he had just waited, um, and I know how painful that moment must have been for him, you know, five days, he has to look at um, the smoldering ruins of where he lost half of his family. Um, such a terrible tragedy. Um, I could see why he just wanted to erase it. You know, he wanted to um, stop that pain. Uh, that visual pain every time he looked at it. So I understand it, but he also in doing so um, prevented himself being, from being able to find closure. He, both he and his wife um, yeah. from finding closure. We did, you know, <clears throat> we did kind of have a comment. Remember we were talking about the Sauter House Five afterwards and you had said that the one kid said he had oh, yeah. John. seen them upstairs yeah. and they, and he took that back. Do you want to no, so he didn't see, but he was he was told by his frantic parents, go go to the attic and get the kids. And he went to the stairwell and he yelled. And when he came back outside, I'm sure because he was completely panicked by the whole situation, he said, they're not up there. Mm -hmm. He never actually went and put eyes on mm -hmm. the kids. Mm -hmm. So he was the only child that never discussed the fire and the aftermath of it. He never got involved in trying to find out if the kids were still alive. Um, he refused to kind of participate in the family conversation around that. And, and you I think totally... it's because yeah, he felt guilty. I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. He felt guilty. And also if he definitively says, I didn't go upstairs, I didn't see them. Like, I just have this image of, of black smoke coming down that stairwell. That's all I see. Um, when I'm imagining him standing there, it's just black smoke coming, um, come, like, unable to ascend the stairs due to all the smoke and my sense was in that moment you know he's calling frantically upstairs but they were long dead like they were dead um they were the first to die is my theory <clears throat> well yeah because they were the only ones to die but still they were they went fairly quickly the first to die yeah the first and only to die um <laughs> shut up <laughs> oh man whatever. I can't get away with anything with you around. Anyway. Um, yeah. So, um, you can understand, you know, why he didn't want to take his parents hope away as they searched, right? Yeah. He didn't see them. So maybe they were still alive, you know? Um, 
a horrible tragedy all the way around poor family but they're you know they're together now so yes it's okay it's all right yes. life is hard all right um do you want let's see what are, what are we doing next Sam? so the know. so the theme of motherhood is yeah. um the book you want to bring forward is lethal outlook mm-hmm. lethal outlook whoop, whoop. Okay, so this is, I don't even know. This is uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is number nine in the series. Sorry. <laughs> Technical difficulty stuff's falling all over the place. Um, number nine in the Abby Cooper Psychic Eye series. Um, I got my inspiration for writing this book. So basically, in the book, <clears throat> the mystery is a mother, um, it, a mother of a small child, a toddler, <clears throat> disappears in the middle of the day. Her husband comes home later on, finds the child um, crying and wet um, in his crib upstairs. No sign of the mother. So she's absolutely, she's just vanished. He's under suspicion and he hires um, Candace, who is Abby's sidekick and a private investigator um, to look, to try and clear his name, try and find his wife and clear his name. And um, a couple of twists and turns um, get you to that end. But the inspiration for this book actually came from a story. Um, I think I saw, I think I, I either heard it or I saw it, um, but it was of, of a woman who had two young children, very similar to our case today. <clears throat> and she disappeared in the middle of the day as well. She was abducted from her home. And um, the, the super tragedy is that um, another driver, another woman driver, had been behind a car where a woman was um, bound, her hands were tied and she was desperately trying to get out of the car. She was trying to um, bang on the windows and um, screaming for help. And this woman called the police and you can hear the recorded call where the woman's like, she's, I know she's in trouble, she's, she needs help. And the dispatcher's you know, kind of relaying information and distracted. And the woman says, they're turning left, they're turning left. and there's no answer from the dispatcher. And she says, should I follow them? And there's, you know, the dispatcher says, we're sending, the police are on their way. So she didn't follow them. And um, unfortunately this woman was found strangled and murdered, um, you know, a day later or whatever. Um, and so that story really, really, really stuck with me because God, you know, help was there. Like it was there, it was there. Yeah. And, uh, to be so close and still lose your life. It just it was horrible. And I, I'm sure the woman who was trailing her um, also, I mean, how do you ever let that go? You know, yeah. all you had to do was turn left. Um, but it got like, it was, I, I understand there was traffic and she couldn't easily maneuver over. Um, and the dispatcher was like, police are on the way. You don't know where they are in relation to this. You don't want to get in the middle of a high-speed chase. Should that happen? Absolutely. Yeah. So um, yeah, I've always thought about both that mother and the witness, like really just my heart goes out to both of them kind of equally because it's an impossible situation or impossible decision that you have to make like that. And you don't yep. get, you don't get a do over. So, <clears throat> yeah. So that's the inspiration for lethal outlook, um, available everywhere. Books are sold, but if you want to learn a little bit more about it, you can hop onto my website, victorialaurie.com. You can also go there, um, to schedule an appointment. If you want an appointment with me, do, 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 get on my calendar. Um, and, um, you can sign up for my newsletter. So I am, we did a, a few predictions last week, um, for 2022 and I'm fleshing those out, uh, this week. And hopefully I will be able to put, to send that out early next week. Um, I'm aiming for Monday or Tuesday to send that out. So you'll see the big predictions that I have for 2022 coming up. Excellent. Excellent. Awesome. Well, the other thing, that, the other reason why I really like the um, Lethal Outlook is that it is the precursor to the, the wedding book. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Fade, <laughs> which um, is de de Deadly Forecast. Deadly Forecast. So in this particular book, Kat is so uh, adamant about planning Abby's wedding that she, in, in one scene, kidnaps Abby, forces her into an office space and sits her down. Do that to me. I know you would. I know you would. No, if you had the money, I would you'd not. Be like, Victoria's not responding to my calls. Go get her. <laughs> well, this is why, A, you're not getting married, and B, I don't have the money. So, no point. Let's write about it in fiction instead. <laughs> you don't know me. Things could change. <laughs> 
shit, I'm only 55. I've got years to still get married. You do. Another 55 years to find oh that God. true love in a nursing oh, home. It's You'll not going to happen at this point. Mm-hmm. It's so sad, but whatever. Okay. Well, try a nursing home. I'm sure you could find an eligible bachelor there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks for that suggestion. Uh, uh. All right. <laughs> so would you like to get into, oh, no. Um, you had a mom connect because it's motherhood. Yeah. You know, oh, you had a motherhood anecdote. connection. Yeah. yeah. This anecdote is, um, this anecdote, <clears throat> you know, I, a lot of these readings kind of blend together and they, <clears throat> you know, I don't remember them a week later, even, even the ones that are really good. I have to kind of write them down, you know, on a card, um, to remember a lot of the details. Um, this one, I think will stay with me for a long time. It was such a beautiful reading. This woman's this woman came through for her son. Her son, I think, was in his 60s, probably early 60s. And he was very, very close to his mom. Um, and she was like, she had she had she had four children that were born alive. One was a stillbirth. The very first child she had was stillbirth. And there's a story behind it. Um, and her, the love that she had for her boys, oh my God, she just kept you know, sending that feeling through me, that unconditional love. And I love how they still mother from the other side. So he had had a recent leg injury and he was favoring the leg and she was all over him about, you know, you have to do your physical therapy. You have to get that leg stronger. Um, And she wasn't like, she was just like nag, 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 nag in a good way. Right. But um, I get a little self-conscious because I'm passing on the message and I'm like, he's thinking that I'm like, being a pain in his ass, literally a pain in his ass. And, uh, no, she was just, she was all over him about taking care of himself. Um, and they, they do experience worry over there too, which I thought was really interesting, which means if they experience, because she was worried about him going up and down the stairs. So he has to go upstairs to get into his, um, condo and, um, that leg really can't support him. And he's like, stairs scare me. And I'm like, they scare your mom too. She's worried. So it was interesting to feel worry um, from her, which tells me that the future is not necessarily cemented, that you have the choice. You can get that leg better or you can continue to kind of pull it along and it doesn't get better. And, you know, you could set yourself up, not that he was destined for, but he could be setting himself up for an accident, right? So it's interesting how, in some ways the future is set and in, in other ways, it's just really not. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's a crapshoot, I think. Um, anyway, so <clears throat> his name was Thomas, his older brother, as I mentioned, the first of five boys that she had was, um, a stillbirth and he was a stillbirth because his mother had fallen and, um, had gone into labor and the child did not survive, um, birth. And, um, cause I had said something like, were there four or five? I kept getting four, five, four, five. And he said there were five children born, but only four survived. And he said, you know, that was my older brother. He was born, stillborn. And um, that was the thing. My mother would never talk about it. She would never tell us, you know, what happened or anything about him. And he said, he's buried near her in a cemetery. And the other brother that had of the four that had been born alive, who had crossed over, um, was buried, uh, with him. They were buried together. Um, and her mother and his mother arranged that. Um, and, um, so you can kind of feel as he's speaking, you can feel her listening, you know, like, okay, I'm going to tell you why. So she basically let me know that, um, the, the, the overwhelming guilt that she had over losing this child, Um, she felt completely and totally responsible because she had fallen. And, um, so an accident, she took full responsibility. She didn't, you know, throw herself down, down the stairs or try and trip and fall. Right. This was truly an accident, but she bore the burden of that guilt. And I had asked him, I said, was your mom a pretty devout Catholic? And and when they show me a cross, that's like, they're devout. Um, uh, and she made me feel like, church was hugely important to her. And he confirmed that she was a devout Catholic and that, um, she was, you know, heavily involved in her church and she was, you know, um, by the Bible kind of person. And she said that in losing that first child, she felt like she had let God down. She felt like she had, um, 
done something really unforgivable in, in God's eyes. And, you know, I'm almost going to get um, misty about it because it's so, ah, oh, it's so upsetting. It's so sad that we walk around thinking that something that is all love could ever be disappointed in us or could ever be angry at us or could ever be a vengeful God, right? Um, because there's no hint of that at all, at all, at all on the other side is just love and understanding and acceptance in of us in all of our, you know, kind of failed forms, but she took that on. So she couldn't bring it up because it was the thing that almost broke her. And that was why she was such a devoted mother to the next four, because she had experienced that kind of loss. And, um, and then she was really interesting because I, he said, is, is that brother with her? And the only brother I had sensed was the one that was born alive and had died, you know, I think it is fifties or sixties. Um, and, um, that's the only brother that I could sense was with her. And so I was asking her, I said, you know, is this child, is this first child with you? And she said, no, it's already cycled through. So that child, that soul That's had amazing. reincarnated. Huh? That's amazing. Right? So yeah. she literally drew like a circle, like has circled through. And um, she said, um, he's now attached to Chris. And I said, I said to Thomas, I said, who's Chris? He said, That's my brother. And I said, Does Chris have any children? He said, Yeah, he's a boy and a girl. And I said, I wanted to say, right, because logically I was born a boy, right? I wanted to say, oh, that's the boy. But she was like, No, it's the girl. It's the girl. Wow. The soul wow. came through as the girl. So wow. we did a little bit of like automatic writing afterwards, you know, just yeah. to make sure. And G I R L came through. So um, this child had picked a the stronger gender. <laughs> to come through the second time. Um, so I thought that was really beautiful um, all the way around. Such a, Absolutely. such a beautiful energy, such a beautiful soul, such a loving soul um, and free of the guilt, yeah. free now of the guilt, which is wonderful. So that's my little anecdote for the week. All right. So let's get depressed now uh, and talk about <laughs> our latest case. I have to admit that when I first um, stumbled upon this, this is um, listed as one of the top 50 unsolved mysteries, you know, Dorothy Forstein continually comes up. And when I first came across this mystery, it, it really bothered me a lot. Um, what happened to her and because your mom, yes. So it's partly that, but also just because she was so vulnerable and innocent, I guess, in this, yeah. this is not something she invited. So yeah. Yeah. let me share the, the story. She's, she's known as the vanishing housewife. And between 11 and 1130 PM on the night of October 18th, 1949, Dorothy Forstein was abducted from her Philadelphia home, never to be seen or heard from again. Her husband, magistrate Jules Forstein was out for the evening, attending a political fundraiser and her 19 year old daughter, Myrna was out socializing with friends, but Dorothy's youngest daughter, Marcy witnessed her mother's abduction. When Jules Forstein arrived at home at 11.30 that evening, he was horrified to find his two youngest children, Marcy, age nine, and Edward, age six, clinging together in their bedroom, huddled on the floor, crying and shrieking, mommy's gone. Marcy told her father and later the police that roughly 15 minutes earlier, she had been awakened by a loud sound and got out of bed to investigate. She then witnessed a strange middle-aged man in a brown peak cap climb the stairs and enter Dorothy's bedroom. Her mother was lying on the floor, face down, resting. The intruder then rolled Dorothy onto her back, picked her up, and slung her over his shoulder. And when Marcy asked the stranger about what he was doing, he replied, go back to sleep, little one. Your mother is all right. He then patted Marcy on the head and carried Dorothy down the stairs and out the front door, locking it behind him. Marcy told the detectives that she had never seen the man before and had no idea who he was. What became of Dorothy Forstein has remained a mystery for over 72 years and counting. So the romance between Jules Forstein and Dorothy, who was known as Dora to her friends and family, uh, Dora Cooper, started when they were teenagers. But after it came to an end, Jules met and then married Molly Mel Melaton. Jules and Molly had a daughter, Myrna, in 1930. And then unfortunately, Molly died in 1940 during childbirth when their second daughter, Marcy, was born. Shortly thereafter, Jules and Dora quickly rekindled their relationship and married in 1942. Their son, Edward, was born in 1943, which turned out to be a very fruitful year as Jules' professional life became 
um, more prosperous. He moved on from a clerk position in the Philadelphia City Council to become a magistrate, and the family took up a residence in a three-story brick home at 1835 North Franklin Street in Philadelphia. Dorothy was a petite five-foot-two blonde, was happily married to Jules, and was well-liked by her circle of friends and neighbors. So it was shocking when late in the afternoon on January 25th, 1945, Dora was brutally attacked in her home by an unknown assailant. Earlier that day, Dora had dropped her children off at a neighbor's house so she could do some shopping. And she reportedly joked with the butcher and, the, and chatted with friends as she went about her errands. By the time she returned home, it was nearly dark. And as she entered her house, she was attacked from behind and beaten by her assailant's fist and saw some sort of a blunt object. As she stumbled into the hallway, her flailing arm knocked the telephone off its base, which fortunately alerted the operator. And upon hearing the commotion, the operator quickly contacted the police as Dora was pounded into unconsciousness. Dorothy was found concussed with a broken nose and a jaw, and her shoulder had been fractured. She was rushed to the hospital, and when she awakened, she could only weakly explain that someone jumped out at me. I couldn't see who it was. He just hit me and hit me. Police interviewed a neighbor, Maria Townley, who had witnessed Dora's return home and reported that she thought someone was with her or perhaps walking behind Dora as she made her way along the sidewalk to her front door. It was dark, so Maria did not get a close look at the man trailing Dora. And instead, given that the neighborhood was considered safe, she never imagined that Dora was in trouble. Captain James A. Kelly of the Philadelphia Homicide Division and a lifelong friend of Jules concluded that the attack was an attempted murder. Nothing from the house had been taken and Dora had no known feuds or enemies in indicating her assailant intended to kill her. Police posited that the attacker might have been someone who appeared before court in Jules, with Jules, excuse me, and had assaulted Dora for revenge. And while Jules couldn't think of anyone who could have held such an intense grudge against him by attacking his wife, police focused on a gentleman named Morris Anmuth, a 29-year-old salesman who had been arrested for disorderly conduct at a Thomas Dewey political protest. At the time of his arrest, Morris was severely beaten by two Philadelphia police officers, James McCarthy and Samuel Ralston. The beating was so severe that Morris had to be treated at a local hospital. Ignoring the officer's despicable conduct, Magistrate Forstein upheld the charges and served Morris with a $10 fine. Morris countered by filing assault and battery charges against the two officers. He claimed it had beaten him for nearly 20 minutes. Officers McCarthy and Ralston were held on a $1,000 bail each by Magistrate James McBride. However, the charges against the officers were later dropped by Magistrate Jules Forstein. Despite their suspicions and ongoing investigations, no arrests were ever made regarding Dora's attack on that January evening in 1945. Understandably, following the beating, Dora became paranoid and was constantly on her guard, anticipating another assault. She habitually locked her doors and windows and refused to venture out on her own in the dark of night. As such, Joel seldom left his wife and children at home alone in the evening. But the night of October 18th, 1949, Jules had to attend a political fundraiser. As he left his office, he called Dora to check in on her and reassured her that he didn't plan on being home too late. Dorothy replied that everything was fine at home, and she joked with him for a moment, finally seeming more like her old self. Be sure to miss me, she reportedly said as she hung up the phone with him. Dora spent the evening with Marcy and Edward, and around 9 p.m., she phoned a friend to arrange for the two of them to take a shopping trip the next day, and she sounded normal on the call. At 10 p.m., Jules called to tell Dora that he'd be home soon. When Jules entered his home at 11.30 p.m., he found his young children hysterically crying, Mommy's gone. While Jules was stunned by his daughter's account of what happened, he hoped that perhaps Dora had gone out to see friends or a neighbor. He telephoned several, but no one had seen Dora. Panicked, he called his good friend, Captain Kelly. The detective immediately had his men checking local hospitals, morgues, and hotels all over Philadelphia. Police went door to door in the neighborhood, but no one had seen anything unusual. Officers also searched the Forstein home for evidence and discovered Dorothy's purse and keys. However, nothing in the house was amiss. No fingerprints were left behind by the intruder, nor were there any signs of forced entry. Police were baffled by how a man could have walked down a city street with a woman in her pajamas slung over his shoulder without someone noticing. The search for Dora expanded beyond Philadelphia. Captain Kelly sent out 10,000 notices to police departments and institutions with Dorothy's description and a request to check all unidentified women from hospitals, including mental hospitals, hotels, morgues, and convalescent homes across the country. Police were at first skeptical of Marcy's account. However, after being interviewed by a UPenn psychiatrist, Yale Nathanson, they became convinced that Marcy was telling the truth. Jules Forstein died in 1956 of heart failure, 
And in 1957, Judge Charles Klein of the Orphan's Court declared Dorothy officially dead as of October 18th, 1956, seven years after she had vanished. Judge Klein's decision was based on a petition filed by Dorothy's stepdaughter, Myrna. Captain David Roberts of the Philadelphia Homicide Squad concurred that all efforts of police and private investigators had failed to discover any trace of the missing woman. My sources for this story were Wikipedia, strangeoutdoors.com, The Strange Disappearance of Dorothy Forston from February 13, 2021, The Claremont Sun, The Mysterious Disappearance of Dorothy Forston by Mark Hoover on July 5, 2021, pressreader.com, The Vanishing Housewife, Nikki Allen, Psychic De Detective, 1021, The Reading Ingle, 1025-1940, and American Hauntings, Inc., Actually, that was 1025, 1950, excuse me. And AmericanHauntingsInc.com, The Vanished Housewife, What Happened, Dorothy Forstein. What was really interesting about this last reference is that the um, author had posted, and I quote, for decades, no further word of Dorothy Forstein appeared in print. Then in 2003, I featured the story of Dorothy Forstein on my website. And soon after, I received a letter from an attorney from the Forstein family asking if the story could be removed. The letter was not threatening. It merely made an appeal for privacy of the family members and asked if I would consider removing it from the internet out of consideration for their grief. I agreed to do so, and I later learned that several sites that also featured my article on the disappearance had received a similar letter. I thought that was like really creepy, like 2003 versus the youngest child would have been in his 70s at that point, I think. Mm -hmm. So anyway. Yeah, this, is a, this is a much deeper story, I think, than it, <clears throat> than it is on its surface. Um, and um, there are a couple of layers here. Um, and I, I'll tell you, when I was first tuning in on um, Dorothy, not necessarily on her disappearance, but really I started with the beating. I kept seeing a, a police badge. Um, uh, so I'm wondering, I think that there was I don't think it was the salesman, right? Who was beaten by the police. I just don't, I don't get that for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, if he was bent on revenge, why target her, right? Mm -hmm. um, he would have dar um, targeted the husband for sure. Um, it, it, he, would, he would be risking way too much to go into um, the house and beat yeah. her. And I yeah. just didn't get that. The police, however, um, I felt like a mm, vibe with them, like mm, something's up, something's up. So I have a feeling that um, Jules knew um, that these cops were guilty and that he had been strong armed into um, dropping the assault charges. Um, but I think that his conscience started to get to him. And I think that these two cops were worried that. Um, he would go back on his on his word or would op reopen the investigation or something along those lines, right? Because he could have, he dropped the charges. So he could have brought them back up on charges if he wanted to. So I think that they beat up Dorothy, at least one of them beat up Dorothy as a message really? to him. You better not. Oh my, oh my God. Yeah. And then I think that there might've been something else that had to do with the police where Jules was feeling compelled to, um, maybe reveal something that they did not want him to reveal. So um, to send the message, they broke into his house again and kidnapped her. Um, was it one, was it two? I'm not quite sure. I, I can feel one definitely, but it feels like there's a, there's a partner. <clears throat> Interestingly, when you had said that, um, you know, she lived on a safe street um, and, <clears throat> um, who wouldn't, you know, who wouldn't notice when slung over someone's shoulder, right? Um, in the, um, down, a, down a street, down a, down yeah, in a, her pajamas, a, swung over, the, exactly, swung over someone's exactly, shoulder. Exactly. You know, so, so when I sense. tuned in on her actual disappearance, like what happened from the time that the, the children saw her to the time that she was out the door and disappeared into the night, I kept feeling like she was taken across a field, like mm -hmm. that she was taken across a, a wide open area. And so, um, out of curiosity, I pulled up the address, um, which actually isn't the specific address anymore. It's been replaced because there's some new homes there, but directly across the street is a park. Mm. So I think that these guys parked across the park, waited to see Dorothy walk home or come home. They would have known Jules was at a political fundraiser. They would have known he had to attend. So there was that safety, like he's away and we have time. 
you know, mm-hmm. because why target that night? And how would the sales guy know that Jules wasn't going to be home at 1130 at night? Right. When There's, there was no way to know. So it had to be someone who had a connection to the politics and the um, police force. Uh, yep. So I think, I really think it was these two police officers, but I think it was a much larger thing. I think that there was far more corruption um, and that Jules was aware of it and that he was, um, as the magistrate, I think he was, uh, he wielded a significant amount of power and could have opened um, the floodgates of investigation and to keep him quiet. Um, they first threatened him by beating her up. And then when he started to show, show signs of cracking, they were like, okay, message, here's, here's another message. And um, I think that's why you don't hear a lot about how he, like, did he offer a reward stance? Or um, no, I think his he called his friend, the captain of the detectives, mm-hmm. uh, James Kelly, uh, mm-hmm. who was part of the homicide division. Um, they were lifelong friends. So Kelly mm-hmm. was really driving the search for Dorothy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's the one that sent out the flyers, et cetera. So yeah. I think that was a legitimate connection. And I think this Captain Kelly didn't suspect that it was these two police officers. Yeah. Um, I don't know that Jules mentioned it or didn't mention it because he might have been afraid for his children at that time. I yeah. was just kind of going to let his friend follow the trail. Mm-hmm. But it just feels like the whole thing is much richer than how it appears on, you know, a stranger broke in and um, absconded with her in the night <clears throat> that it just doesn't sit with me. There's something much, much, much deeper um, and richer to the story. And I, I think that's another also reason why they don't want this thing opened up again because, right. you know, cop families, right? Lineage. Right. So right. there could be grandchildren still on the police force in that area. Um, and if you have something like that happen to like your grandmother, um, you're not in any hurry <laughs> to start pointing fingers, you know, um, mm. you kind of want it to go away. So yeah. especially the brutality of it, I you know, know, she's this little petite five foot two person who did nothing wrong. I know. And, um, you know, she's turned into a message for her husband. So it's just, it's brutal. Poor woman. Do you um, have a sense of what happened to her? Oh, they, they, they killed her. They murdered her. I think, I don't think she was dead when they took her out of the house, Mm -hmm. but she died very shortly thereafter. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know if like, I keep feeling she was thrown in the trunk of a car. That Mm -hmm. for me is like, there's a big feeling of her being tossed into the trunk of a car. Mm -hmm. Um, I get that she was taken to a wooded area. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think that she was just quote unquote disposed of. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that she was dropped near a water source. Um, and I don't know that area at all or what it looked like back in the 19, 1949. I don't know what it looked yeah. like back then, but there's a feeling of like rocks, water, woods. Um, so I think that she was just dis- dispensed with, um, probably, you know, strangled and killed or shot and killed something along those lines. But they, that was a hit. Unfortunately, it was a hit to keep him, you know, in line. Um, my goodness. My sense. Um, and then um, you had a point on this one, but I forget what it was. Um, well, when she knocked, when her, when the beating took place in 1945 and her arm hit the phone, yeah. the operator heard the commotion. So right. if it was a police officer, he would have known oh. that the operator was going to uh, notify the police. He might've yeah. even been someone that should have responded to the situation right. and needed to leave right away in order to right. um, exactly. appear legitimate. So, yeah. And, you know, the other thing that I kept hitting on too, was that um, the way that they got into the house Um, I kept feeling like there was a spare key that was probably kept above the door and um, that's how they, that's how they let themselves in. But I do believe that they were watching her for a period of time before they, they broke in and beat her to a pulp the first time. Mm -hmm. Um, And then, you know, Jules was good for four years and then not so good. And so they finished, finished the message, unfortunately. So that's what I think happened. Um, you know, don't know if I'm right, don't know if I'm wrong, but the whole idea that a random stranger broke in twice or two random strangers broke in and beat this poor woman to a pulp for what reason? Like for, for what, right? Like just a random act of violence in the middle of a suburb with no, you know, it wasn't like this guy was doing this to other women, right? She was the only one. So this had to have been a message. And um, I think it was easy 
to send her husband a message and foist her blame on um, a suspected well, criminal, right? Yeah, more, more like, this, was, this was for revenge, you know, for yeah. you dropping the charges, right? Um, when really it was a warning. And then um, four years go by, and I think it, this really aided Jules. Or I think it really, really aided him. Um, and, you know, as Coyle's, it would any husband who's in love with his wife, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like she's beaten in his home. Like, yeah. Insane. And mm -hmm. with a blunt instrument. So I don't know if it was a billy club or, you know, Probably. it was a very intentional, a very intentional yeah. beating. Yeah. The point about the spare key, I think is interesting because from what I read, she was very um, diligent about ensuring windows and doors were locked because right. she was so paranoid after the attack. And what's two points that are interesting about that. If Jules suspected that the cops did that to her, he might've told her that he suspected it was the police, right. which made her certain about locking everything. Right. But the night of this particular event, when Jules was at a fundraiser, her oldest daughter, her 19 year old oldest stepdaughter, Myrna went out with friends. And that's mm -hmm. probably why that key was left yeah. was so that Myrna could get back into the house yeah. after hours. Yeah. That was my thought exactly too, that the key was kept in a quote unquote safe place yeah. the top of the door or i didn't feel it was under the mat i kept feeling like it was above <clears throat> like at the top the rim of the door and um she would have done that because she had children and you know kids lock themselves out of the house all the all freaking time so yeah. um if she was beaten in that house there's no way she would have if she was away from the house would have wanted her children not to have access to the house so that kind of leads me to believe like there was definitely a key um, yeah somewhere located somewhere and these well, guys he locked he locked the door on his way out yep. which tells me that there was a key use somehow yeah um yeah yeah so, so it's really awful yeah, yeah. This, this has bothered me a lot so i appreciate your insights it, it's just a really sad tale of a it really is. woman who was so innocent wrong. yeah she she's nothing, nothing wrong. wrong she was completely innocent victim um and um you know like most victims, they were, you know, great. In this particular instance, it was, it took place in her home and it was very purposeful, not to send them to send a message when in, in fact, Jules was the one that they were after, but they used his wife as the vehicle by which to influence right. him. So exactly. I think that's really pathetic. Well, if they um, targeted him, um, it's a different message, isn't it? It's, it's, um, it opens up a lot of public, right? Like, oh, this magistrate got beaten up, right? Versus his wife. So you can almost believe a random stranger broke in, right? But if he gets beaten up, it's it's kind of a different thing. It's a different vibe. No, I, I understand. I mean, yeah. I think they were very clever, but at the callousness of it all, mm -hmm. she was expendable. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I really appreciate your insights. It's um, I really appreciate you bringing the story. Yeah. Um, so it, given that it is winter time and my second least favorite month of the year happens to be January because it's so damn cold in the Northeast. What's your first I thought, favorite? Or first least my, favorite? First Ever? least is March. Oh yeah. Because it's like that winter just, it just won't die. Won't, it won't yeah. end. It just doesn't end. It's endless. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, I thought it'd be fun if we visited the beautiful state of Hawaii. Yeah. Um, there are a couple of mysteries that have been circulating around the islands for the same amount of time. They all took place in a similar time frame. Um, and not sure if they're connected or not. So it'll be interesting to kind of dig into that. Yeah. And perhaps we can have a tropical drink at our side. I was just, yeah, I was just gonna suggest that. It's like you're in my mind. Um <laughs> get out, get out. Um, yeah, yeah. I think that's a great idea. Like a tequila sunrise or you know, something with pineapples, um, pineapple juice. Oh, I've I've got one. I've got a really good one. Okay, I'm sold. Let's do it. Okay, super. So looking forward to connecting again next week on yet another pod, podcast, a PEM podcast, mystery. Psychic Eye Mysteries. Doo, doo, doo. And again, if you want to um, connect with me, victorialaurie.com. Laurie is spelled L-A-U-R-I-E.com. Um, you can go there for all the stuff on me. Doo, doo, doo. Um, yeah, that's it. All right, guys. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sandy. I love you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you um uh to all the Until haters next time to all the haters who have been leaving a comment here or there kiss my ass okay and with that we're out <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> bye